Welcome to Some Bits, where we decode the power school development experience. Some Bits is brought to you by MBA. Let's start the show. Hello again, everybody, to another episode of Some Bits, joined as always by Ryan Cockrum and Eric Scheidel. Our wonderful, prestiged guest of the day is Greg Satterwhite, the king of power school scheduling. So, of course, that's what we're going to talk about today. Before we get too far into it, what are we drinking today? I am sticking with the Bourbon Trail, going with a little, with a little uh, Driftless Glen. This is a single barrel. It's actually a store pick. Um, big thanks to Alicia for for getting this bottle for me. Um, I actually just cracked it open, and for being barrel proof, it is quite smooth. It's pretty tasty. Coming in at ninety six proof. What are you guys drinking? I went back to. Uh, uh, I was I was looking at my favorite Bowmore. Uh, the other day, but then it's twenty dollars more expensive than my Ardmore, so I went with my Ardmore here because I really like it and it's peaty and delicious. So there's what I'm sticking with. I I spy a little bottle of uh, Angostura bitters back there. Yes, that is from uh, a, a previous uh, afternoon that you showed us to do uh, your um, uh, old fashioned recipe. That's the whole reason I got that. The traditional old-fashioned. Mm-hmm. And it was good. Sean can, that, Sean can that, direct that, you in making that, a great old-fashioned. So, so, Eric, that, I got to tell you, quick, quick transition, quick uh, quick side note. Um, I was up in Wisconsin just last week and went out to eat at a place um, actually over by your house, Eric, the Via, Via Dolce, which is a little uh, Italian restaurant. And on their menu, they actually had a menu item called um, like the a true old fashioned, and after looking at the ingredients, it was a freaking Wisconsin old fashioned. And I thought for sure, let's see, it's still wrong. It's not a true old fashioned, but of course they just had to call it that because they're in Wisconsin. Exactly. Anyway, I was just gonna say they can call it whatever they want. They're in Wisconsin, yep. so we can we can fight about that another time. Eric, what are you drinking? All right, I got a theme today. I got one, and I got a backup. Uh, I'm drinking from the Lakefront Brewery, which is in the Milwaukee area here in Wisconsin. And I'm starting out with a nice Maybach, uh, German-style lager. And in honor of our guests today, I also found a Bumble Bear, which is a honey brown ale. So why is this in honor of our guest, you might wonder? Yeah. Because yeah, my well, nickname for him is Honey Bear. <laughs> Whereas uh, Sean and Ryan are just dirty hippies. <laughs> I was more concerned about uh, Nick Pirani getting jealous. Oh, yeah. Let's hope he doesn't watch this episode. I'm sure he doesn't. Nick, all the love, buddy. <laughs> Greg, are you joining us with the, with the drink today? Yeah. So um, I have a... Mary Lou's coffee mocha porter that mm. was created by a brewery just uh, about a 10 minute stumble distance from my house. Uh, Mary Lou's is a local coffee chain and they do a collaboration every year uh, on a beer. Um, it's a really good one. And then one of my new favorite beers is an IPA called Green Warden. And it's by a, a brewery up in Maine, uh, Portland, Maine, called Banded Brewing. And they actually make it with spruce tips. So the taste is um, slightly Christmas tree, but not uh, overwhelmingly Christmas tree. And it's like one of the best IPAs I've ever had. Mm. You, you drink beers like I like. I like right. it. Exactly. <laughs> Can I just say that the the moment that I realized that Greg Satterwhite and I would be lifelong friends is when he came to a Wisconsin PSUG one time, and I was uh, I was graced with the the responsibility of entertaining him for an afternoon. So we went to the Great Dane Brewery in Madison, which is a brew pub from Madison. Wait, is this the pasty story? No, 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 that was a different one. We'll tell that on a different episode. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but I mean, a different episode when, when Greg's back on, or like we can't tell it until he's not on the episode. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. That, Fair enough. That was when I realized that Greg had a love for beer and even had an app that he introduced me to for beer. 
Okay. And I thought this guy is okay. We should have him on a podcast that we'll invent one day in the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I want to know what this this uh, uh, app is. Oh, it's um called Untapped, uh, U N T A P P D, and, and you can uh, search for and check in your beers. Um, you can tag other people in the app with beers, describe the beer, rate the beers keep track of all the different beers that you've tried all over the world. Um, it's really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. I've actually, I've used that app, but more just to figure out what type of beer I'm looking at on a menu. Cause like the, so many places have gotten into like the naming of beers where it's just like, you know, name a beer doorstop and you don't have any idea what that means. So you have to find somewhere to look it up. So a lot of like Google searches will end up taking you to untapped. Well, yeah. I'm downloading that right now. <laughs> well, while Ryan is downloading a new app about beer, Greg, we know you as the scheduling guy. You're the scheduling king. Um, tell us a little bit how that even happened. How long you've been in power school? How did you get into scheduling and what have you been up to? Yeah. Um, so my scheduling career in power school sort of started before power school. Um, I worked for a small SIS company here in Massachusetts called Nordex. And back in the late 90s, PowerSchool did not yet have a scheduling building component. And our software did. And we were acquired by PowerSchool. And basically, our scheduling program from Nordex kind of integrated into the PowerSchool product back in the late 90s, around 2000, 2001. Um, so it goes way back to then. Uh, later, I was working as a trainer and a tech support guy and uh, worked for Power School doing mostly scheduling training um, and a little bit of everything else. Um, back in 2006, when Power School was uh, sold off to uh, Pearson, I kind of uh, expired with Apple. Uh, so it was kind of a funny story. It was like Monday, I'm at a build workshop and we are all getting these calls saying that Pearson is acquiring us by Friday. We need in all your new work agreements and all the paperwork. And um, as of next week, you're gonna be an employee of Pearson. And I'd already been thinking about leaving to do consulting on my own. Uh, so. Wednesday came along, my manager called and said, Greg, we don't have your paperwork yet. And I'll never forget this. I just said, yeah, about that. I'm all set. She's like, what do you mean you're all set? <laughs> <laughs> so there was a lot of freaking out about that. And uh, I just kind of expired with Apple on that Friday. So I didn't officially leave. I just kind of expired. Yeah, cool. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. That's a very creative way to quit. I just had a visual, somebody like twisting off the top of Greg Satterwhite's head and taking a sniff and just putting it back in the fridge. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> for me. Expired. <laughs> well, before we, uh, before we started recording, you were kind of mentioning where all you've been. You didn't give a time frame on that, but uh, you're a busy guy. Yeah, this um, time of year, especially the last couple of years without the uh, 200,000 plus miles of flying around, um, doing all remote. So typical day like today, I started off at 5 a.m. in Saudi Arabia remotely, uh, made my way to New Hampshire for most of the morning, uh, touch base with Argentina this afternoon in the Netherlands. And right after this podcast, I'll be working in Japan for three or four hours this evening. <laughs> and then doing it all over again tomorrow. So that's what my typical day looks like, April, May into June, uh, the last couple of years. Are you uh, are you looking to go back to traveling more or are you enjoying the remote? Yeah, so, you know, um, I, I think both of them have their pros and cons. Um, it's nice in one sense to be home, I'm not, spending a lot of time in airports and catching flights and 
getting to hotels and all that kind of stuff. So it gives me a little bit more time to actually do work uh, from home. Um, although I love travel, I've never gotten sick of travel and I like to go places. Um, and, you know, it, it, I kind of look at it like I've just about been everywhere by now. Um, I've actually been to 130 countries. Um, I've worked with people from about 65 different countries. Holy and, God. you know, I'm kind of getting to the point where, you know, I'm all set. I can be home. Uh, maybe my vacations will be uh, bigger trips instead of uh, working bigger trips. Um, and it's kind of worked out. Um, the other thing, too, Eric knows this. I'm actually running for local political office. So if I'm working from home, I can actually do that if I'm not on the road uh, so much. Do you have like a yard sign that you could like pan across the... <laughs> I don't have one. <laughs> we should uh, probably stay out of uh, local politics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. That's awesome. Yeah. Vote Greg Satterway. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, I mean, not not exactly about scheduling, but I'm just curious. Is there any any country that you haven't been to yet that you're like dying to go? Um. So there are a couple of major ones that somehow I've never gone to in all of my crisscrossing all over the place. India. Oh. Somehow I've missed India. That's a big one. Um, I love that too. I I need to go uh, someday. There are a lot of places there that I'd like to see. Um, and the other major one for me is New Zealand. It's never been on the way to anywhere that I've gone before. So yeah, that's that's yeah, the destination. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I can't imagine you accidentally end up in New Zealand. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> one thing I'll never awesome. forget, uh, and I know we need to get to power school <laughs> topics here eventually, but speaking of Greg Satterwhite's travels, because I know this man is so well traveled, I remember asking him one day. All right, what's the place, man? Greg, if I'm going to go somewhere, and correct me if I'm wrong, Greg, Norway. Yeah. Um, so one of my favorite places is Norway. Um, just love it. Uh, I'm a cold weather guy. I uh, love the cold weather. Um, people are nice. The mountains, the fjords, beautiful nature. Um I'm a little uh, OCD and organized, and everything is very well run in Norway. Um, so that ticks a lot of boxes for me. Um, just love it. Uh, one of my favorite places. So, so how much do you like cold weather, though? Because I live in Winnipeg. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like Winnipeg. Cold. Canada or nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Apparently, Winnipeg cold is a different thing. <laughs> but I was actually in Winnipeg like three Novembers ago, and it was uh, that it was, was a mild winter, below freezing. Yeah. Uh, interesting. All right, so, so here's here's how I'm going to segue into power scheduler. You say you're OCD and super organized. How in the world? Do you like Power Scheduler? Because typically, most everybody that I know that has ever used Power Schedule Scheduler is just kind of like flinging things at the wall and see what sticks and see what's right, and then try again. Including uh, me. No. So in my world, everything happens for a reason. So if something happens, there's a very specific reason uh, that it happens. So one of my favorite ones that I get all the time is the build will stop for some reason. And the message will just say, the reason the build stopped is unknown. Are you saying then, you can decipher that one? Yes, what that always means is the teacher who is assigned to that course or teachers, it will be impossible for all of the things that they've been assigned to be scheduled either based on their scheduling preferences or the preferences of the courses that they teach. So I will interject in saying, if you are the man who can interpret the build errors, yes, you have mastered Power Scheduler. Right? Because <laughs> that is where all of the pain is, is trying to interpret those error logs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I've Maybe. never met an error I didn't know the answer to. I mean, at some point you didn't, but you did figure it out, I guess I'll say, right? Yeah. And, yeah. That's, and that's impressive because, like, I mean, back when I was working for a district, I definitely, you know, did my time with Power Scheduler. And we had, uh, you know, probably a counterpart of yours. We had Ross Abel. I don't know if you remember, know the name. No, we had, we had a, a gentleman from uh, Pearson named Ross Abel. He would come and do our power scheduler for well, the Greg first. didn't work for Pearson. Right, right. <laughs> but I mean, maybe just in, in, you know, in passing, you knew. And that was who did uh, worked with us. And uh, when it came to the, the build errors, woo we like, <laughs> those were cryptic. Like, yeah. they, they were really not helpful at all. Sometimes yeah. they were when you got towards the end and there was just little bits left and it'd be like, yeah, this sections over limit and things like that but those those unknown or th there is ones even worse than that i'm sure you can you can share with us here but uh no if you, if you can figure out those the greg's your man for power scheduler that's for sure yeah on that note do we need to like hi like is your email address hidden from google so they can't reach out to you or <laughs> um i bet it could be found um, <laughs> you know i'm i'm kind of warped in a way that um, I don't mind if people email me questions as long as they're very specific um, and I don't have to do a lot of follow-up to figure out exactly what they're asking. I actually enjoy that. Um, I don't like the emails that just say, my schedule doesn't work. What should I do? <laughs> or here, can you do the work for me? <laughs> yeah, pretty much, which is really what they're asking. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm the exact same way, Greg. Absolutely. Yeah. If you if you do all the research and tell me all the errors you found and all the things you've tried, I will absolutely help you from there. But it's so hard when you're just like, yeah, here, do the work for me. <laughs> yeah. uh, kind of um, a kind of disturbing kind of ability that I have is when I hear something I've never heard of before, I will immediately think of things that I've never seen before that might possibly create this thing I've never heard of before. And <laughs> most of the time I'm right. It's like, I don't know why I'm thinking this, but if you try this obscure thing and check it on, it might actually work. And sometimes it does. <laughs> And then Greg throws the cape back over his shoulders and <laughs> slithers away. Exactly. I think that qualifies as a superpower. Absolutely. So one thing that I'm I'm curious about, I mean, in, in all these episodes of Some Bits, we've talked so much about kind of the um, the transformation of Power School over the years, and we've talked about the how customization has has changed over the years. One thing we've never really talked about, because I don't think any of us are into it that that much is power scheduler obviously power schedulers had a lot of things added to it over there what is so funny over there i don't feel like power schedulers changed at all <laughs> well that's why i want to hear it from from the man the myth the legend yeah, yeah. um actually it has uh slightly See? in some ways over the years um let me try to think of a good example um all right here's a good example uh this is is one that i've been telling about uh, people about the last couple of years. So over the years, I always get the question about um, how to keep two kids out of the same section. There's a constraint that's always been there called the student avoid. So if I pick student one and student two, um, when I load students into the schedule, those students would never be loaded into the same section of any course. And then sometimes I would get the question, well, what if I have like these eight kids and I don't want that kid with that kid or that one or that one or that one and that one. And you're trying to, they're trying to put in all of these combinations of eight different kids and 20 something constraints. And uh, it doesn't work very well. Cause if you try to spread them that way and one of them gets into a section, then none of them will get into that section and they're not getting all their courses, that kind of thing. Well, one of the new things that came to Power Scheduler a few years ago was program balancing, special programs. So in Power Scheduler, if you click on programs, it will list all the special programs that you have in your school. And if you check on a special program, what it does is when Power Scheduler is loading students into the schedule, 
it will equally distribute students across the schedule based on that program. So typical one, IEPs. It's not fair when one teacher gets uh, 15 IEPs in a class and another teacher gets four. They wanna try to spread that out so one teacher doesn't get more IEP situations than another. Well, I thought about it and what if I created a special program for all my bad kids? You know, I get the question, what if we just have these 25 kids that we want together as little as possible when we load them in the schedule. So I jokingly will tell people, just create a special program. You could name it something innocuous like scheduling considerations. Put those 25 kids in that program. Don't check the box to make it show up on the quick look up screen. So they don't even know they're in that program. And then check the box in Power Scheduler. When you load students, those kids get equally distributed across the schedule. That wow. Brilliant. Do you choose programs at that point or is it all programs? No, nope, you can choose which programs you want okay. to equally distribute. So then if there's zero ways for those eight kids to not be in at least like two of them in one in one section, it would still allow that. It's yeah. just going to distribute the best way possible. Exactly. So you could still say, like, definitely don't want Sean and Ryan together no matter what. So we put in the student avoid, but then all of you could be in the scheduling considerations program to be equally distributed otherwise across sections. Podcast over. That was brilliant. That was really? I never would have thought about doing it that way. That's great. You know what? This just actually like makes me think. So, I mean, obviously, a lot of our podcast episodes, we've been heavily talk about development, customizations, things like that. And we, we obviously bring up the application at some times. Um, but I got to say hats off to somebody who clearly understands the nuances and the things you can do with the application. And using it effectively like that, because you did, obviously, right there. That's, I mean, <laughs> my jaw's dropped right now. I don't have words for it. <laughs> it's, it's cool. All right, so for the next 45 minutes, just give us more of those. Yeah. <laughs> but, so, I mean, going back, though, to me, though, saying, like, I mean, I don't, I, I, I can't remember the specific screens, but I remember, um, for a few years, there being errors in Power Scheduler, like on the HTML side. And that's where I was saying, I don't feel like it's changed much. Being like, they still haven't fixed the code on that one. And and those were where I was coming from. So of course it, it's 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 changed and it's it's updated, but I, I, I always felt like going into Power Scheduler, I mean, it's not like I feel like this is actually the truth. Going into Power Scheduler is a different part of Power School. It really is. Um, and it and it has its own behaviors and nuances and, and its, its own personality. We'll even say, yeah. um, do you agree? Do you, what do you think of that? Like, uh, absolutely. Um, so one of the thing I always make clear to everybody who uses Power Scheduler, it really is your own personal playground for coming up with next year's schedule. Um, the things that you do there, you can try any crazy thing you want without affecting what's going on on the live day-to-day -day side of PowerSchool. Um, and the one thing I always illustrate for people is the only relationship that it really has to the live side is Power Scheduler borrows from the live side only three things, courses from the catalog, students and which ones am I scheduling, and teachers and which ones am I scheduling. Other than that, everything is in Power Scheduler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because even the terms are not the same thing. You just have to replicate them properly. Otherwise, you know, there's a power there's a power schedule that gotcha. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I feel like there's there's like a ton of gotchas when it comes to power schedulers. Or power scheduler, sorry. Um Eric, obviously you've not, when we've talked about this before, without you being in a district, um, you've never really used Power Scheduler. I know you've done a few customizations kind of based around scheduling. Um, one one caveat, 
or one area of scheduling that I know you've kind of dealt with that I wanted to talk with Greg about is, is summer school. Um, so I thought summer school might be a good way for, for Eric to kind of join the conversation here. What's, what's been your introduction to, to summer school and your, your dealings with it? So when I think back, uh, I remember the old days and it's always been something at MBA that, that management's been very interested in is how do we manage, how do we handle summer school better? And fortunately, power school itself came up, I think, with a great solution to that because, you know, back in the day, folks had a different server just to manage summer school. And then power school um, introduced the remote enrollment concept, which I thought, you know, without being an expert in scheduling, just seemed at a high level of, and, and Greg, I'll be interested if you have thoughts on this, but just to me, at a high level seemed like just a much better solution than what was happening before. Um, you know, the my exposure to Power Scheduler, it is interesting. It feels like almost a whole new software package that uh, a user has to understand in order to do that piece. And, um, you know, so our goal, my goal in, in the development that I've done, it has been to open scheduling up to more of uh, a college type approach to it. We called it arena scheduling. Um, and the concept behind that is to allow the parents and the students to select their own sections. If you think about if uh, if you've attended uh, post-secondary school, um, you log on when you're given that opportunity and you select which sections of which courses you want to attend at one time, rather than having a computer do that for you. Um, and that can be really powerful. So that seems that seems uh, it was an interesting concept to me and our users, especially from a summer school perspective, right? I mean, that's really the, the heart of summer school is school's not going to say you're taking swimming, this enrichment class this summer and this uh, this additional class this summer. It's typically the students and the parents that are making those decisions. Um, so that's been my exposure. Uh, and we tried to to incorporate that even to into the next year scheduling concept, uh, which was interesting in trying to allow the school districts to integrate uh, an arena scheduling approach to even into power scheduler. Um, so so yeah, I mean, in in, be, in, have, in being able to do that, it, it required a certain level of understanding of power scheduler. But for the most part, man, I mean, my hat goes off to those of you out there in the world that are doing scheduling. Um, it's a complex system, and for the most part, in order for me to do my job, I need to call people that really understand the scheduling piece to help things get set up to a point where where I can take over. And, and create my customizations. So, man, I feel like I was all over the board there, but I'll, I'll <laughs> turn it back to, back to Greg at this point. I'm particularly <laughs> curious uh, how Greg feels about that e remote enrollment in summer school and if that was a, was a game changer, because I feel like it was. Yeah, um, so as far as summer school, um, I've successfully, tried to not be involved <laughs> at all. <laughs> it was just so messy for so long. Um, so Eric's whole point was moot. No, it wasn't <laughs> moot. I, 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 I do have some comments about some of the things he was talking about. Um, for so long, it was really clunky because it was almost a situation where students had two different next schools. They were a next school their school for next year and their next school for summer school. And there were requests for both next schools. And is the kid being scheduled for their next school or summer school? And there's like this um, purgatory in between uh, over the summer. Where is this kid actually going kind of thing? Um, and I've successfully tried to avoid getting involved in summer school. So I have to say <laughs> that I am not an expert on summer school and whether the newest model of summer school works. However, I do know that the remote enrollment is super good feature. And if that's being leveraged to do summer school, um, that that's awesome. And I, I can think of 
perfectly how that would work. Um, I do want to talk about the concept of arena scheduling. Um, there are some pros and cons to that. Now, one of the pros to that is instead of students requesting things, they're able to directly enroll themselves in the things that are available. So you don't have the situation where students have unfilled requests. They can just sign up for the things that will work in their schedule. And once they've done that, they've had a schedule. Now, the only thing about arena scheduling is they don't have choice. So there's two points about that. Um, one is who decides when certain courses are available in the schedule and where there might be conflicts. So I might say, yeah, I'm gonna put this music course at the same time as this uh, visual arts course and students will be able to choose one of those. Well, what about a kid who's really into music and art and they don't have the opportunity to do both of those? Um, I've seen situations where you would think that's not intuitive to have them at separate times, uh, but building a schedule based on, hey, these eight kids want music and art, it was able to find a place in the schedule where they could get both of those things and everything else worked out with minimal trying to fix unfilled requests for other things. So it always comes down to um, the concept of, do we let students have choice, build the best schedule possible, and then work out any of the unfilled things that happen at the end, but we've given them the choice and the possibility of getting everything they want, or do we show them a schedule, let them sign up for things the way they fall in the schedule, knowing that, hey, they might not be getting everything they want, but when they finish that process, they have a full schedule of things that they chose. So two different philosophies. So that begs a great question because um, the, the work that I've done assumes that the schedule is already built and does allow for uh, student requests to be submitted. Mm -hmm. so, so you just really made me think of something that I've never thought about because, again, I come in after the schedule's already been built. Here are the courses we're offering. Here are the sections we're offering. Yep. Uh, so is that a big part of the work that you do is – and is it a big part of scheduling to look at course requests and say there's a lot of overlap here? And is are there tools in Power Scheduler that accommodate that to say, you know, visual arts really should not be offered at the same time as, I'm sorry, what was your other example? <laughs> uh, like a performing music sure. course, yeah. So that is part of the consideration of what you have to do as a scheduler. I. I never thought of scheduling at that perspective before where we have to gauge the interest in the course before we can even. Mm -hmm. My focus yeah. has always been on the schedule set. We need to get butts in seats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are a couple of tools in Power Scheduler. Um, there are a couple of reports. There's a conflict matrix report where I can sort of see who's requested both of these courses and the number of students who've requested both. Um, there's also a report called uh, something to the effect of conflicting courses, where you choose course number one, course number two, and it brings up a selection of students uh, who have requested both. Um, the one point I would make about Power Scheduler, though, is when you're building the schedule using Power Scheduler, you don't really need to know what the conflicts are up front. It's going to be placing every section of every course in the best spot possible for the most student requests to be satisfied. And there are different levels that um, you can place uh, of importance on certain courses, but I don't really worry about the conflicts because I know when I build the schedule, it's going to find the best spots and then we can work with it from there. Yeah, and I should stress, and I, I hope I'm using the right terminology as a power scheduler ignorant person, uh, the build the build process is, is uh, the placing the sections within the schedule, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm gonna stress- The load is after that. 
<laughs> yeah, the stress. I want to stress that the work that we've done doesn't doesn't in no way tries to replace that build process. Mm-hmm. We're assuming the build's already been completed, mm-hmm. and we're you. replacing the load is what we're attempting to replace. Okay. Okay. So, I, I, so that said, I'm I'm hoping that this arena concept at that point becomes a little bit of the best of both worlds. Mm-hmm. But there's no perfect system, right? Yep. Yeah. So I've got a question now um, going on. So my district that I came from, we had about 3,000 students. Um, let's say 20% of those were uh, are, are very small subset of schools um, uh, based on how colonies. So the scheduling wasn't really a thing for that. So let's say 2,400 students. Some of the schools would have max of 100 students. Our biggest high school had 600 students. Uh, and then our other high schools would have about 200 students. Definitely, we found challenges using Power Scheduler more because of our student uh, enrollment, like because of the size. And, mm-hmm. and there's just limitations based on staffing and students. Yeah. So what, what would you would you say there is a make or break um, when it comes to your student population and your staff population for being able to actually leverage power scheduler to its like full effectiveness? Yeah, I think so. Because a smaller school, um, there's probably going to be fewer choices and so many things end up being singleton courses. Mm-hmm. And when power scheduler is building the schedule, it's like, do I put this here for these eight kids or this there for these other eight kids? I don't know. I'll do this one. Um, so that's the technical side of how that yeah. works. But it's basically, that's what it's doing, trying to find the best spot for the most student requests to be satisfied. And when you have so few choices and relatively fewer students, um, I think it it is less effective as a tool for building a schedule. So and actually, that makes a lot of sense because the district I came from had 1,600 students and we had a high, high school of, you know, say 500 students and a middle school of 300 and some odd students. And when my description of like throwing spaghetti, spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks probably has a lot more to do with that than power schedule itself. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And then so like would what would you think then almost like that? Like, so we were able to use Power Scheduler more, let's say, truly for the for the, our bigger high school with the 500, 600 range. And then I would do kind of a hybrid when I was working with the other two high schools uh, where more or less I would end up uploading uh, a, um, a, a, a common delimited file of the actual schedule that I'd work out with the principal and then we'd work the load after the fact. Basically we wouldn't bother. I could never, I could never successfully get a build situation going on with that small of a population uh, where, where we could never get anything to work out. So he would just kind of like, this is what we're going to do. And now let's load our kids in. So, I mean, it's almost like even then would you know maybe the arena situation kind of like we're talking about would be almost the better situation in the long run you have your schedule now you just let the kids go where they're going to go because there's only so there's only so few many options that even when you're when you're talking about conflicts you're you're and kids avoiding each other your best option is they're in the far corner of this room and the other one's in the far corner of the other same room. Or the seating chart issue than a scheduling <laughs> exactly. issue. Yeah. <laughs> so Greg, thinking about the tools that are within Power Scheduler, um, I'm curious how, how much you use Visual Scheduler. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that was a telling... Um... <laughs> uh, and and I guess the second part of the question is, do you see scenarios where visual visual scheduler really is a, a great tool to use? Or okay. is this just a no comment? Yeah, so I'm going to go with no comment. <laughs> That's fair. I think we can all deduce a, a comment out of that. <laughs> That's fair enough. 
the other the other big question I had for you is when you're doing power scheduler, what is because one thing that you know when when I was teaching my counselors uh, power scheduler, you know they they always had the question is like okay what percentage is good enough to then commit and then worry about the rest on the live side, mm-hmm. you know I and I always told them like I, I don't really know like it's it's kind of up to you how much work do you want to do on the live side, yeah. you know is is eighty five percent okay do do we really need to work harder to get up to the ninety five percent. You know, and and out of the the that screen, out of that scheduling screen, I mean, there's multiple percentages on that screen, yeah. which is the most important. Do we need to worry about students without conflict? Do we is we really just looking at the percent scheduled, et cetera? I yeah. would love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I get that question a lot. What's a okay. good percentage? Um, there is no right answer. Uh, <laughs> absolutely, there's no right answer. Um, and it's for many reasons. Um, I was working with a school today and they got a 34% student load. <laughs> However, most student schedules were completely full. So oh. when you look at it, it was the way that they collected requests. Students had too many primary uh, required and elective type requests. So I have a term for that. It's blunt force trauma scheduling. <laughs> if you give students enough requests, it's going to fill all the holes. Now, the problem with that is they have full schedules, but you don't know if the things that are still unfilled are things that they are really supposed to have. Um, so 33% load rate, but almost everybody has a full schedule. Um, then I've seen... Uh, 92% of uh, student requests satisfied. Students don't have enough requests to fill their schedule. So if I only have to fill six out of eight slots um, because the kid only has six requests, then that's very easy to fill. Um, Some of those other percentages that you see are the percent of holes filled in student schedules. And That one is tricky too, because if you're building a a four block, two day schedule, but you've already defined your fifth block for advisory and your sixth block for after school uh, courses, right away, two of the six blocks that you have aren't filled with something. So that's a lower percentage. If you look at that percentage, Uh, there's a percentage of total number of requests satisfied. So out of all the requests for all students, how many were actually satisfied? Well, it could be most kids got everything, but to bring down the average, there are kids that only got half the things that they requested. So I don't think any of those percentages are uh, really anything to hang your hat on. You really need to look at what actually happened behind the scenes and not look at a percentage number for one of those items. There you go, all viewers. Disregard percentages. I, I really wish I'd known that, honestly. <laughs> I really wish I had someone to tell me that. Because especially like, I it, I mean, she, she did a great job. The principal of the school that I would work with of the bigger population, we'd always be trying to just get at that extra point, that extra point, that extra point. And I mean, obviously it's, I'm not gonna go as far as to say it was meaningless. You know, because like you're saying, it's very relative to your your setup. But I mean, there there were so many nuances there that we we you know maybe weren't paying attention to that that percentage wasn't accountable for. So that's a good thing to know. Yeah. So what are the uh, what are some of the other big gotchas that you see in districts with uh, power scheduler? Other well, than other than starting too late. Um. <laughs> I think I, I know what. Let's just pause on that one, then just to bring it back. It's never too early to start Power Scheduler. It's never too early <laughs> to start. That. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that is definitely the case because I, I remember sending out emails and trying to get people for meetings and trying to get people to do things and and getting on the ball with that and be like, come on, I know you you think it's not too early, but 
there's only like a month left or only two months left in this in the school year and then you're on vacation because you're on a teacher contract <laughs> and it's up right. to me to like chase you on private emails for the next <laughs> month before i do end of year <laughs> so yeah. yeah it's never too early to start to uh, power schedule <laughs> um yeah so um as far as gotchas one of the most important things for schools to do correctly is to think about the request type for each of their course requests. So basically three types of courses uh, requests. Uh, required, meaning the student should get them, nothing would automatically take their place. If, if you don't get it, it's an unfilled request, the counselor needs to figure out how to fix that for you. Uh, second request type is elective meaning if you request this thing, you should get it, but if you don't, it's okay to use an alternate request to take its place. And then the third type is an alternate request, which means only use these to take the place of an elective type request. Now, the mistake that a lot of schools will make is they'll do things like, um, and it's an elective. So it'll be flagged as an elective type request. And most schools, if a kid is in the band, they must be in the band. So band should probably really go in as a required type request and not get automatically replaced with cat grooming as their alternate if they don't get it. <laughs> um, so a lot of schools think that because students have a choice it's an elective thing, but there are some things that they do have a choice of that should be treated as required things. They must be in those things. So so it's really like saying, because, and I, I, you know what, now that you're saying it, it makes sense to me, and I'm thinking right. back, like, because you have compulsive credits, mm -hmm. right, and then we would treat required as compulsive, but what you're saying is required doesn't mean compulsive. No, not at all. That's a very good thing to know too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think back to see to remember how how those were set up in my school, because I would assume that they probably had those set up as electives. But the only students that had those elective requests were the kids that had were already chosen for that for that particular yeah. course. No, and I mean it makes total sense because I mean I think of the time I'm in school, like I was a band student, so of course I'd be in band classes, and it wouldn't make any sense if I couldn't get into band to be put into art. Mm -hmm. So of course, yeah, it's required that I'm on the band track and not, I'm not no, on no. art, I'm not on drama. No, I'm sorry, I, I apologize to interrupt, but the, the fallback from band was cat grooming, if you remember. Right, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what, I do have an aptitude, so I guess that would've been okay. I mean, if, if I would've known that that was a course option, like I probably would've chose that. <laughs> And actually, so my my our last uh, guest, Mark, I'm, I'm pointing at you right now. Go talk to Greg. Go talk to uh, Elaine. Make sure they're doing it right. So what else, Greg? Any other major major gotchas you've seen over the you know past decade of doing scheduling? Um, not so much major gotchas. Um. But one thing that if I could preach to everybody uh, who does scheduling, a lot of people think that when you build the schedule, you have an option to uh, import the schedule or import it with student schedules. Uh, so many people think that you, if you import the build with student schedules, you don't have to do the load because the students are in schedules. Now, what I want to make clear to everybody is that sample student load with the build doesn't enforce any of the rules of running a load, like priority of the course, um, using alternates, uh, honoring closed sections at max. Uh, none of those rules are enforced when you just import a build with student schedules. So always run the load. <laughs> What, 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 would be your, what would be your biggest, though, let's say, 
because I mean, like I said, I, 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 there was things that I felt hadn't changed and you said that it has improved. What would be the biggest pain point you do experience still with power schedule? What would be the biggest thing that you would say, like, maybe this is your opportunity to really get it out there <laughs> that you could say that they could make a change for that would, that would uh, help everybody. What would that be? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I have a long list somewhere. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of it used to revolve around uh, reports, but there have been some really good custom reports, yeah. like excluding alternates for unfilled requests. I don't care if a kid didn't get their alternate if they didn't need it. Um, things like that uh, mostly revolved around reporting. Um, there are some interface things that would be nice. Uh, like when you're on a teacher page and you click on the constraint tab to see any constraints that that teacher has, like a teacher free or pre-scheduled things, um, that was a little bit more interactive where you could actually see what it actually was instead of just a static word that tells you nothing about what that actually is. <laughs> um, or even the ability to uh, modify uh, link to modify something right from some pages, like um, the course list report. If I see one thing when I print out the report that's missing on a course, how cool would it be to click on the course right there from the report, fix that one thing and submit it? Um, just little enhancements like that, that would save a lot of navigating around several clicks to do things. Um, plus, I think it would make a lot more sense for end users to be able to see all of that without having to backtrack back out, go someplace else, fix something, back out, go somewhere else and look at it. Um. That, that, yes, I, I, I feel like one thing I will say definitely about the whole interface for power schedule as I'm looking at it right now, still on the screen right now, um, it's like they, they, they brought it up to power school seven and then they kind of left the interface kind of in the whole style and interface like that. And then they continue, of course, upgrading everything and, and, and doing things on the application side. But Power Schedule still seems very Power School 7 to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I would agree with that. OK. <laughs> so there you go. Power School. Looks like <laughs> we'll it. just leave that there. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of reports, Greg, um, we're we're getting close to the end here but I, I am really curious to know because i know like back when when i was helping um my counselors through power scheduler there were a couple you know particular reports that i made sure that they were running and paying attention to to, to kind of work through some issues um are there any like go-to reports in power scheduler that you can think of that are, have been really helpful for you yeah the probably the number one report is the schedule course enrollment report so after you run the student load, the schedule course enrollment report is basically a list of all of your courses, how many seats are available, how many kids requested it, how many kids got in, how many seats are still available, and then the really important one for schedulers, how many unfilled requests you still have for courses. So first time going through that report, I'm looking down that unfilled request column and looking for things like, ooh, 20 kids didn't get biology. Okay, um, do we have enough seats? Sometimes that's no. Um, oh yeah, we're missing a section. We were supposed to have six sections instead of five that we built. So even at that point, it might tell me that um, there's something that we need to do differently building the schedule uh, to get or meet student demand. Um, it could tell you things like, oh, it looks like we have two sections of 24. No, actually we have four sections of 12 and the max should have been 20 to accommodate more students. So that's a really good go-to report. Um, the other report that I like that uh, people don't really do that much with is, I run the master schedule list report which is a list of all of my sections and their attributes. And I'll sort it by uh, course name. And one thing I always do is 
look in the group of where courses um, are grouped together on the report, look at the number of students who are in sections of that course. And when I see like 18, 15, 17, 16, 5, 14, 19, <laughs> I'm like, what is going on where there's that five? And that might tell you like, hey, it ended up for 10th graders that there's this one block where there's just too many things for 10th graders to do. And maybe where I see section sizes of 20 for 10th grade things, hey, if I could move one or two of those things at a time where enrollments are really low to a time when they're really high and reload students, I get a better balance. Huh, that makes a lot of sense. Look at you and your logic. <laughs> <laughs> well hey guys that's all i had did you guys have any more uh burning power schedule i, I know this kind of turned into more of a more of an interview and less of a conversation but it's it's been great greg thank you so much for being yeah. on yeah um, hopefully be you know hopefully we can get a lot of counselors watching this episode and and you know first of all it's already april halfway through april you should already be in yeah. there but uh, <laughs> maybe save this one for, you know, for around December, January. But anyway, Greg, thank you very much. It's been yeah, a great time. Thanks for chatting with us. Everybody out there, until next time, have a good one. Cheers. Cheers. Have fun. Thanks for joining us. And a special thanks to our subscribers. Consider becoming one today. Enjoy more episodes and learn more at mba-link.com. Mm-hmm.